I have been playing games my whole life, and the modern day loot box is probably one of the things that bothers me the most. It's something you see pop up in many of our favorite games, except they are often unwanted badges of shame. They can appear harmless, they can be crooked, they can muddy up our fun by locking off the best goodies and treats behind paywalls or arbitrary grinding. Some of them go so far as to be cash only. The worst ones partner with manipulative game design, designed solely to drive you to the point of madness. A place where things are put so far out of reach that you'll consider bowing down in frustration as you reach into your wallet. Checkmate. Today, I will discuss the implications of that shiny, not so innocent little crate. Many games have fallen victim to the very tantalizing embrace of the loot box, like the deadly kiss from Poison Ivy herself. The modern day loot box first sprung up in popularity with Team Fortress 2 when Valve took the game into the free to play territory. While their origins reside in earlier times with Chinese games like ZT Online and Puzzles and Dragons, mainstream loot boxes began definitely with TF2 supply crates in 2010. The supply crate in TF2 was created to keep the game afloat as the years went by and sales started to diminish, income supplementation. The team at Valve banked on the very addictive quality of that little box, locked off to generate them an alternate form of never-ending revenue. The supply crate is a temptation that many gamers get suckered in by. I mean, just look at this thing, a mystery box holding unknown treasures, tightly wrapped in an iron lock that can only be opened by a very shiny gold key. I mean, damn, I want one just looking at it. Over the next few years, this simple concept would be the new trend for our favorite video games, especially MMOs like Star Trek and Lord of the Rings Online. At first, locking off items behind small paywalls seemed kind of intrusive, but it was often brushed aside. Some of these games were free after all, or had smaller price tags than their AAA friends. So a natural trade-off made sense as long as you could earn those items through traditional gameplay. It might take a while, but the idea was that you could get every single paid item by spending enough time in the game. But things would change with the AAA market. The handling and misuse of these boxes would surface in and destroy the fondness for many of our favorite games in the future. Mass Effect 3, Call of Duty, Halo, Battlefield, Shadow of War, Force of 7, and NBA 2K18, they are but a small list of the very most guilty. They would all go on to implement some sort of box, card, pack, or crate. Whatever the design though, they had the same prerogative, mistreat the base game design. Pearson wasn't so stingy with requisitions, I wouldn't have to steal. The implementation of such loot design never carried innocent intent. They were never introduced into games to make them better or more fun, they were created to make money plain and simple. We can obviously compare something like Modern Warfare to, I don't know, Call of Duty World War II. Both games have similar progression, yet one is tied to performance and the other is tied to money. The ironic part being that COD 4 was perfectly fine without modern day loot crate design. What does the micro gambling in World War II actually do for the game? The answer is nothing, it does nothing. Let's make things more frustrating, time consuming and potentially expensive for everybody. The first problem that surfaces with traditional loot boxes is that they are often negatively influencing the way games are designed. This is the thing that people who say, if you don't like them, don't buy them, fail to see. Let me paint you a quick picture. In order for a loot box to get you to purchase it, it has to inconvenience you enough that you're willing to bypass its alternatives and hence purchase it. Generally speaking, most items in loot boxes can be acquired through grinding, aka the alternative. If you don't want to pay, you can play. But such is not always the case when things get messed up in the way that they have been. Smart developers have realized that they can tweak with these parameters and extend the time honest game players have to spend in the game to get the same rewards. For instance, in Shadow of War, you can purchase in-game crates to help you advance yourself in the final act of the game. So step one for WB Games is to make sure that many of us will want to do that, so how do they do that? They make the game more tedious for us. They decrease the experience we get per quest. They extend the time it takes to get resources needed to progress through the game. They frustrate us. They make things more grindy. They push us to want to drop real money in the game. 
This is the reality of video games that feature micro-gambling and loot crates. It's no longer play instead of pay, it's play until you pay. If a loot box wasn't in place, things wouldn't be a chore. Things wouldn't be a grind, as rewards could be tailored to our time and effort spent into the game. But with such a huge focus on capturing the marginal dollar, it would seem natural to want to turn convenience and proper game design into laborious chore fests. And this is exactly what games have been doing lately. Star Wars Battlefront 2 is a noteworthy example here. In what would culminate into one of the biggest controversies by far of the year, EA did just that. It bent an otherwise great experience into one that was essentially pay to win. Is there a reason why it takes dozens if not hundreds of hours to unlock our favorite things in Star Wars Battlefront 2? Why every item in the game was crafted to be cooler than the last, yet more tedious to get, simply to steer you towards that in-game store? No, there is no reason for it other than greed. When done proper, video games are created to challenge, excite, and reward players, the key word being reward. There's no reward in Battlefront in spending your entire life in the game to unlock something that was once driven by challenge. The point remains, if microtransactions were not in video games, things would be balanced, things would be easier to obtain, and games would be more fun in general. Nothing would be out of reach for the awful sake of making you frustrated. Loot boxes have been introduced into game economies because publishers have been besieged by competition. With so many games, often cheaper and more addictive out there, the traditional AAA game has had less market share to work with. In turn, that does affect profits in a negative way. The acceptable way to counteract this has been the introduction of cosmetic-only loot boxes. Skins, hats, pink dresses, glowing weapons, and glittery capes. This is all 100% fine, so long as you have a marketplace that allows people to purchase these items directly should they choose to bypass the micro-gambling. What is not okay by any and all means is hiding power inside crates of any kind. The worst loot box design, including Star Wars Battlefront 2, resides in dishing out power for money. The result is an uneven playing field where some players have clear advantages over their adversaries, leading to frustrating and uneven gameplay experiences. Weapons inside loot boxes that are stronger than others. Upgraded abilities, star cards, boosters to get ahead of everyone else. It's all garbage and the only thing that it builds is hostility. Gamers holding these opinions are entirely validated as nobody wants to play a game that gives the better gameplay experience to the richer. With no way out but the checkout line, loot boxes are today here for one single reason, to earn your money. Don't be fooled by how shiny and cute they are, or how they explode and shower us with treats like a piñata. This is business. While so tiny and innocent at first glance, loot boxes are to be feared. Unessential for game design, yet essential for long-term financial success. That's what they want us to think. The worst part about loot boxes is that they promote negative tendencies in gambling. Some people out there do not have the ability to control themselves. It's really selfish and unethical in an industry that is completely unrelegated to let pro-gambling habits fester and flourish. If the gaming industry was regulated and age restrictions were cut and dry and enforced, cosmetic loot boxes would be perfectly fine. But it is not. Not by a freaking mile. Anybody, kids, children, anybody can get their hands on any game in this industry and become exposed to these addictive systems anybody. When a game's sole intention is to get people entranced into that spell, we have a bigger issue on our hands. We're talking about a system here that can potentially bankrupt people, cause depression, addiction, and reliance on a slot machine simply because game makers can't earn the money themselves. And that is such shit. The solution to the state of gaming does not require loot boxes. It does not depend on breaking the minds of players with twisted systems designed to strangle us with tedium, gambling, and irritation. There we go, old switcheroo. It lies in the creation of amazing video games. It seems like it's almost a whisper these days, something that's been lost in time, drenched in the hysteria of greed that our industry currently lives in. Video game companies need more money, they say. Fine, that's fine. So earn it, innovate, create and wow us with games that deserve our money, not games that try to take it from us.